So good morning, everybody. Good morning. Uh, uh, welcome to the second day of the conference. Uh, I'm really excited to see the rest of the talks and, and we can find them. Um, hopefully, this one will start the day off right with a little bit of energy. I think NoSQL is probably one of the the most energized fields right now in in web and application development. Uh, there's it is, you can't turn around without hitting another you know key value sword somebody wrote or a Dr. Murray Davis slapping in the face with his documents. And so uh, hopefully I can bring a little of that energy and that excitement that people are, are actively working on this even as we speak. Probably some of you are hacking on this right now. Um, and to keep you guys get you going for the rest of the conference. Now, uh, the subtitle of this is Gap Relational Databases, but that question mark at the end is extremely important. I'm not advocating that we take all the MySQL developers or the Postgres guys or, or you know, any Microsoft SQL server developers out back and shoot them. Um, I would never suggest that. <laughs> That would be terrible. Um, but I do want to sort of question the, the prevalence of the relational database model. And I think that's what is at the root of the NoSQL movement. Um, but talking about that, let, let's, let's actually dig into sort of the, the, the fundamentals of the NoSQL movement. And I think there are, there are five main reasons why NoSQL has sort of taken off, though we generally only hear about two of them. Uh, the first one we generally hear about is performance. Uh, so you see benchmarks here and there about how fast Mongo is at inserts, or Redis is at reading things off out of memory because it's all in memory. And, and they're compared to the detriment of the relational model with you know, standard Oracle and other benchmarks. Um, there's a huge amount of debate about performance benchmarks. And it's really light up here, otherwise you'd see Houston Bolt and all his uh, fastest men allowed for you. Um, Benchmarks are, they're good for some things. They're not, it's kind of like code coverage, right? It, you can get a false sense of security from having high code coverage, just like you can from having really good benchmarks. Benchmarks are typically very artificial, cons, uh, under artificial constraints in very unique circumstances. They might not hold for your data, so it's always best to take them with a grain of salt. Um, that said, it does look like a lot of the numbers <coughs> are thinking are a lot faster than even the relational database that you might be using. I don't know about you, but you know, my applications aren't generally database bound. Uh, that's not the, the driving factor for me. So, so we're going to move on from this one uh, and talk about the second reason that people often present for going to SQL, and that's scalability. And scalability and performance are often conflated, uh, which just confuses the issue, right? It, it's, it makes some people extremely upset when that happens. I'm looking at one of those people right now. Um, but you know, scalability is the, the, you take one thing and then you, you your one box or one node, or whatever, <coughs> then you scale it up to, to a, a whole lot of nodes. And, and the ease with which you do this is, is the easier it is, the more benefit you're perceived to get from it. Right? I think this has become an important argument because of the web. Right? So in, you know, 20 years ago, before the web was huge, um, before the web actually even really existed, I guess, uh, we had desktop applications, which did not have to scale to huge amounts, right? Because they're on your public machine and you're using it. You can only generate so much data in a day. And you had enterprise systems that could generate a lot more data. But even then, it was, I, I think, still a fraction of the potential that we have now with web-based software, right? You, your software can be seen by billions of people, literally billions of people. And they can upload, you know, 100 photos a day. And now you've got hundreds of millions of photos a day. It's, it's, it's a whole new world. Um, as far as scale is concerned. And so the database systems that we're accustomed to over the last you know, 20, 30 years, uh, they, they seem lacking because that sort of extreme scalability wasn't a priority for a very long time. Postgres was a nightmare for replication for a long time until a couple years ago when they finally invested effort in it, and now it's much easier. And I think that's an important point, actually. For both performance and scalability, to me, these are really bad reasons to go to SQL. There is nothing fundamentally true about relational database systems that makes them, that guarantees that you won't be able to get adequate performance out of them, or you won't be able to scale them to the right level. In a lot of cases, it just hasn't been focused on because they haven't had that need. But if you wait, you know, Moore's Law will make things faster, and as you see with Postgres example, uh, we can make systems scale better. So those are sort of, uh, I call them contingent reasons to like most well. Uh, if you wait a little while, you'll get adequate performance out of the, the relational system. So there's no reason to sort of jump on the nose for being like wholeheartedly. There are, however, several reasons that are more fundamentally the case. Um, so flexibility, right? 
in your relational schema, you're going to be you're going to constrain that schema, and it's hard to change. Like if you run an ultra table over a, a table with you know 100 million rows, there's a real cost associated with that, and it's, it's painful. It's like the the schemas and relational systems are built in some inflexible material like steel or wood, um, whereas the schemas in if they even have schemas in no SQL systems are, are paper, right? So you can fold up the paper into this this uh, cool cicada nymph uh, origami thing, then you can unfold it and refold it into a frame and then you can unfold it and refold it into you know a paper airplane or whatever you need at the time. And it's much easier, uh, fundamentally much easier to do this because the schemas aren't you know, set into the database management system like they are on the relational side. So I don't think people talk about this one, uh, but I find it particularly interesting because it introduces a whole family of NoSQL solutions that we don't normally talk about when we're sort of off the cuff talking. Okay? The locus of work means that databases can do stuff for you. Oftentimes it's better than you can do it for yourself. Right? So relational databases are built on you know, relational theory, which means that you get a lot of functions that are built into SQL for you. So you get aggregations and sorting and, and all of that stuff, it, it's not just magically there whenever you have any sort of persistence engine at all. Right? If you use a key value store, you might not get aggregations, probably not, as a matter of fact. Um, but the, I mentioned the family that we don't often talk about, it actually differs from relational databases because it's based on an entirely different set of mathematics. Right? It's based on graph theory. So if you had an IMDB and you wanted to figure out how you could get Charlie Chaplin to Jet Li, because who doesn't want to connect Charlie Chaplin to Jet Li? Um, if you're, built, you're building on a Postgres or something, that's going to be a pretty expensive query to find the shortest path. If you build it on a graph database, shortest path planning is built into the database itself. Right? It's way easier to get this done. It's always going to be more efficient. It's a fundamental characteristic of how the database is constructed. And it's going to be easier to find this in a graph database than in a relational database. And then the last one, this is like my favorite one. I, I, if you've seen me talk in the last eight months or so, you've seen me uh, give my comics is hard talk. Comics is hard talk, not really hard talk. Um, where I spend most of the time ranting about the current state of the comics industry and how hard it is to model it in a relational database because I've been trying for the last couple of years and I've spent many of this night. Um, and the point is that certain domains map onto certain structures in the persistent player much easier. So relational databases are great for things like e-commerce data, um, user accounts often, right, anytime you have a lot of relations. Shockingly, relational databases work pretty well. If you've got something more like a social graph, hey, it's got graph in the name. Maybe a graph database would be a better model for it. And it would be, even if it uh, appears more complicated to set up, it can be easier for developers to understand. And since we all use Ruby, we know that you know, keeping developer productivity high is, is a valuable thing in and of itself. So I mentioned comic books that I, I've given a version of this talk or a relation of this talk a number of times about comics. So you're going to see some comic stuff in this one. My example of the complex domain, my, my go-to example of the domain you do not want to model relationally is comic books, as represented by this chart, <laughs> which is a, a chart of the romantic entanglements among <laughs> members of the X-Men universe. <laughs> so, so, so you've got green arrow lines that uh, indicate unrequited infatuation. Um, you've got pink, which is you know both parties are flirting. Uh, green are the only ones that are uh, uh, unidirectional. All the others are bidirectional. So flirting is pink. Red is is a uh, you know a casual encounter. They like, kissed or had a one night stand. Purple is they dated for a while. Blue is a serious relationship or marriage, sometimes involving children, sometimes not. And then dashed lines, which can be any of the others, are a parallel universe or alternate reality version of the You can actually see that Wolverine gets around quite a lot. Uh, Dave, Dave doesn't do too badly for himself. Um, we're, uh, Chuck Xavier, not so great, but he's bald and, and, and you know, I guess that's a turn off. Um, so anyway, right, think about putting this into your relational database and trying to get useful information out. Think about the number of joins you, you would need to make and how inefficient that would be. Right? And that's a, again, that's a fundamental feature. If you put this into a, a graph database, as we're going to do later, um, you'll, you'll see that interesting data just falls out of it happily. And so, so those are the reasons, I think, that are sort of most uh, often presented for looking at the NoSQL sort of movement as a whole. But, but what is the NoSQL movement as a whole? I've got, I've got a problem with the name. My problem isn't that it attacks uh, relational databases or that it, uh, it's all negative, it's only defining things by whatnot. My problem is that it's actually really, really broad. 
So NoSQL handles things like key byte stores, which are essentially just distributed hashing, right? Um, and, and there are, each one has different bells and whistles that make it more or less useful in certain circumstances, but that, that's essentially the base of it. And you got examples like Amazon's Dynamo, which you know, very few of us I imagine have actually worked with. Um, P Store, which is distributed with Ruby, which is pretty cool. If you guys want to experiment with uh, a key value store and you don't want to install anything new on your system, try out P Store. It's in the standard order. Redis is the hot topic on key value stores. It is um, in, in minute. It, Keeps all this data in memory. We're going to talk about this more a little bit later. Uh, dumping out periodic snapshots to disk. It's extremely fast because everything's in memory. Um, but it also has some downside because of that. And then GTM. Do, do any of you know what GTM is? Ah, uh, Jeremy. Of course you do. Uh, so GTM is a key store that's been in use for a number of years, maybe decades even, I don't really know, in the financial sector. And it's had a long and distinguished history, as uh, someone I saw put it. Um, but it sort of exploded on the NoSQL Google group a couple weeks ago, and there's just been all these furious, like, why are you guys talking about it? We've been doing this forever. Blah, blah, blah. Anyway, so GTM uh, is apparently a, a valuable member of the QI stores as well. And the second family, uh, we're going to our column oriented stores. And of the four families I'm going to talk about, these are the ones that are hardest for me personally to get my head around. Because all the others, uh, they, they map easily onto things that we already use, right? So key value stores or hash tables. Uh, document room databases, which we've been seeing a little bit, can be thought of like each document is a row in your table, whatever. Column oriented stores flip that. Right? So instead of having rows as the fundamental unit, you have columns as, the, as you might expect from the name. Um, unlike key value stores, which are non structured unless you actually add structure into them, which we'll talk about, uh, column oriented stores are, are semi structured, which means that you can sort of, uh, there are relationships that you can build within them. Uh, with fundamental technology in the database layer. Uh, Google's Big Table was probably the coming out party for column oriented stores. Uh, when they published a paper, it exploded. Everybody's like, wow, that's amazing. How do you store so many web pages? And now we know. Big Table. HBase is an open source column oriented store. Cassandra is particularly interesting because it is, uh, it's run by, it's open source uh, for the last couple years. It was developed at Facebook by one of the developers of Amazon's Dynamo, which was a key value store that I showed you before. But it is heavily informed by Bigtable. So it, it's like if Amazon's Dynamo and Google's Bigtable had a little baby, it would be Cassandra <laughs> and it would be awesome, as, as we'll see. So, so we're going to talk more about some of these as we go through in more depth. Document oriented stores are probably more familiar to you than, than many of the others because uh, when Couch exploded on the screen, I mean, it exploded, right? All of a sudden there's no Couch and wham, Couch is everywhere. And then there's a sofa bed and there's slip cover and there's futon. And it's, a metaphor taken to extreme. Um, right, so, so document stores are are also semi-structured in that you can have relations, and there's sort of one big relation built in. Right, you've got a document, and then it has key value pairs within it. So there, there's that that ownership of the concept of the document, and then it has stuff within it, and then you can have embedded documents within those, depending on your, your server and whatnot. So I mentioned Couch, Mongo. There was a great talk on yesterday. I don't know if uh, Michael's in here. Um, but there was a very in-depth talk on Mongo that when Concrete gets the video, I would advise all of you to watch. Um, is Anthony here? No. So I, I think, and I might be getting this wrong, I think Anthony Eden wrote RDBB after Couch came out because he wanted a, a Ruby version of it. Does that seem right? Yeah. So, so if he's here, you, you know, punch him in the head for contributing to the, the ecosystem, or you know, hug him or whatever, poking him, high five. And then React is sort of the new guy on the blog. Um, as far as I can tell, React really sort of exploded after either the New York NoSQL Meetup or the NoSQL East Conference. Uh, it's another document-oriented uh, database that gives you a lot of cool stuff, uh, but I'm not going to talk about it anymore than that, so hey, yeah. Then this is the last family, and I mentioned that I don't like NoSQL because it's too broad. All of those three are sort of less structured than relational databases. Key value stores have no structure. Column and document-oriented are both semi-structured. Relational databases are very structured. Graph databases are sort of like the next step beyond relational databases and the amount of structure they let you do. Uh, as a, you might guess, they're based on graph theory, which I am not a mathematician. <coughs> uh, so I, I know about graph theory, but I can't explain it to you. So if you have any questions on that, I'm going to look confused and, and probably cry. Um, but so, so the reason that we often ignore graph databases, though, I think there are a couple. Uh, one of them is graph databases have been around for at least 30 years. People have been using them. People have been developing and running production systems on them and having a great time doing it. But they haven't been open sourcing it. 
So all of this graph database machinery out there in the world is sort of invisible to us in the open source community, unless we happen to go in and work for one of those companies. Luckily, or happily, that's changing. Uh, you've got things like Allegro Graph, which is built in Java and Lisp, and I know Relevance is using the Allegro <coughs> projects, uh, and I'm like uh, pinging the guy every week to see how it's going. I think he's annoyed with me now. Maybe that's kind of annoying. Um, ActiveRTF is, is not really a graph database, but it's like, a, as far as I can tell, it's a graph layer on top of other databases. So there's an ActiveRTF MySQL bridge where you can access the MySQL stuff as if it were a graph database. Uh, I haven't dug into it very far, but a guy emailed me about it. So, so I obviously pass on that here to you. Uh, and then Neo4j is the one that I'm most excited about. It's written in Java. And that means that you can get to it through JRuby. And actually, this is the Neo4j is the reason that I installed JRuby on my laptop. Uh, not that I hate Java or anything, I, I don't prefer it, but you know, it's Java, it's fun. Um, but I wanted JRuby so I could play with Neo4j because it looks amazing. And it's, it's got a lot of momentum, even though it lacks a lot of critical features for, for large production deployments. Um, it's moving and it's, it's improving and it's open source. So you can contribute back to it if you're smarter than me, which isn't hard. So, uh, I've given you some of the broad families. The next natural question is, for all of those motivations, we identify performance, scalability, flexibility, uh, where the work happens, and uh, uh, complex domains, uh, it might make sense to figure out where are these, these options all fit. Right? So on the performance metric, uh, basically, and everything I say here is just sort of in broad strokes. Um, within each family, the database is different. So some column-oriented databases are more, going to be more performant than others. And some might, and so these aren't hard boundaries, right? It's not like all column-oriented databases are faster than all document-oriented. They, they can they shift around a little bit, but these are sort of the general, as I understand it, like rankings, right? So key value scores are going to be fastest because they have no structure that you have to dig through. Column-oriented scores, document-oriented scores are going to be very, very fast because there's relatively little structure. And this can be slowed down by your interface. So Couch uses HTTP, so it's going to be slower to get stuff out of than you know, Mongo with its native accent. The relational databases and graph databases. So performance is a tricky thing, and I mentioned this when I talked about benchmarks. It really depends on what you're doing. So if you're trying to get out all the children that some guy had in 1837 because of doing genealogy research, you know, a relational database will get those has many relationships really, really fast. If you're doing shortest distance between Jet Li and Charlie Chaplin, a graph database is going to be way faster. So those could easily flip flop depending on your particular scenario. Scalability, the other reason that I don't feel like we're going to want to scale. Uh, key based stores are easily to scale horizontally. Right? You just uh, give the dispatcher a way to associate a key to know where its stuff goes, and it, and it works. Um, and I should point out that many of the key based stores, column oriented and document oriented, have scalability built into them by default. Replication and other methods of getting uh, things out there. Like Mongo's working on auto sharding, which sounds really cool when they get it done. Um, column oriented stores, you know it can scale because Google's using it and they have more data than you do. Um, <laughs> document oriented stores are they're built for this, right? Uh, things like Couch, where Couch's reliance on HTTP as an access protocol uh, slows it down some. It also opens up the potential of being more scalable because HTTP is built around, uh, part of it is built around scalability. Um, relational databases, hard to scale. Graph databases, and these are some of the features that aren't quite baked on here for j for instance. Um, it's unclear how they're going to scale because they're sort of hyper-relational, right? It's, you have, if you have to have all of your things related to a node on the same physical device, that's going to present unique scaling challenges. <coughs> Flexibility is schema, and the chart's going to start shifting a little bit. Key value stores have no schema, right? They, they actually have no structure at all unless you go in and add it. Uh, like, by default, there's nothing there, so they're going to be the most flexible. Uh, I would say document-oriented stores and graph databases are probably about the same. That's what orange, what orange means it's about the same. Uh, and the reason is that, and again, I'll use graph, uh, the graph database of my experience with Neo4j. Right? In Neo4j, nodes and edges are essentially like documents in a document-oriented database. Right? They're just uh, associated key-value pairs. Um, which means that if you don't actually create all the relationships, then you're just working with a document-oriented database. So clearly, it's going to be as possible as a document-oriented database. Uh, column oriented stores are actually a little less flexible. Uh, if you look at Cassandra, you have to define uh, small aspects of the schema at startup. You have to say this column family will hold either columns or, or, or super columns, which we'll, we'll talk about. And then relational labels, obviously, they're the ones that are set in stone and, and the thing is about to change. Locus of work, 
generally, p-value scores, column oriented and document oriented scores are not going to do a lot of work for you. Uh, there are some exceptions to that. So Redis uh, lets you do sex, and so you can do intersex and things like that. Uh, and then column oriented, they give you a little more, but it's relatively negligible compared to what you get from relational databases. Right? So there's a, a wide range of things that we're familiar with that we can do with relational databases. And then graph databases, which also give you a wide range, though it's a different set of things that you get for sort of free that you can push down to the database layer and calculate. <laughs> And then the domain complexity is how they stack up. If you have a non-relational domain, right? So something like you're just hosting a catch, right? So I have this key and, and some data that you want to catch, right? Then that's p-value scores. No relations between them. Column oriented and document oriented, they're both semi-structured data. So if you have um, in, in the Rails world, like all you have are has many relationships down. So you have one has ones or has many's, right? Then those are, that's sort of the sweet spot for domain modeling for column and document oriented scores. Relational databases, if you have a relational domain, right? If you have maybe some many to many's, you've got, you put in some join tables, you're good to go. And then graph databases, uh, I, I say they're good for hyper relational domains where everything is connected to everything else. And you cry when you look at your relational schema because it is like table, table, and then everything's black with all the connections being drawn around, right? Uh, or kind of like that X-Men picture I showed. So uh, let's dig into and actually see what accessing and using some of these systems looks like. Redis is the key value store I, I mentioned. Um, it lets you store a couple of different types, right? Strings, every, every key value store will let you store strings. That's like the base case. It also gives you lists, and so you get list operations like push and pop, and sets, uh, which give you set operations. I believe there's a new release coming out soon that's going to add ordered sets to this, which will maintain their order you know, or, or sort for you while you work with them. Uh, which will be useful for a lot of cases. Redis is, the data is held in memory, and at configurable intervals, you can say, uh, after 100,000 know, changes or 60 minutes have elapsed, write it to disk. And so if your computer crashes, then you, you can boot it back up, and you've got the last snapshot from disk. So you might lose some work, but you won't lose the whole remaining. Um, Master-slave replication is super easy. And then it, the problem with Redis is that it's memory bound. And I discovered this. I was a judge for Rails Rumble this last year. And Hurl, which is Chris Monstros and Leigh Holder's uh, awesome project, it used Redis for its persistence layer. And if you're not familiar with Rails Rumble, you're given a line node, uh, like a slice, to run your app on that has a certain amount of memory, I think, like 256 or something. And Redis you know, lives in memory. So as more and more people use this application, because it was really cool and really useful for a lot of cases, different development, um, that, that memory starts getting a little more used and a little more used. And eventually, it was all gone. And at that point, their box crashed, and their application is, if you have an expanding data set and you don't have an expanding you know, RAM set, then you, maybe you shouldn't be using Redis. Because it is, it is, it lives in memory, right? And so if you take away its living space, then you, you've lost. And so, so uh, hey, comic books. Um, so all my examples are comic book related. This is, this is the, uh, the Green Lantern after all the other Green Lanterns died. Um, so Green Lantern, the new Redis, this is how you set a key, it's pretty easy. For most of these examples, I'm going to be going pretty close to the metal, like the Ruby, as close to the, the actual like way you work with the, the system as I can. So this is just uh, Redis RB, you have know, anything. Um, so you set a key, you can set a name, you get it back out just by asking for it, and then you can delete that key. Uh, this is how you use the list, right? You're pushing it onto the tail of to-dos where, hey, i got to lose my time and power, great. Uh, I've got to mourn my dead loved ones because I have a lot of dead loved ones. And then I've got to blow up all the zombie layers when an uh, alpha layer's battery gets, you know. Um, I'm not going to go into the because of Blackest Night for all of you to, to, to be happy. Uh, and then, so you want to get out the list where you can, you can do range operations. And like I said, with sets, you can do intersects and things like that. Uh, another key value store I didn't mention was Tokyo Cabinet. Tokyo Cabinet, uh, in the base case, it stores strings, but it also lets you store tabular data in something kind of like a relational database table. Um, but the most interesting thing about Tokyo Cabinet is the ecosystem around it. So there's this whole like suite of Tokyo tools. Um, there's Tokyo Cabinet, which is the data store. There's Tokyo Tyrant, which is the network aware version of the data store. It's like the server, and so you can talk to the server. Tokyo Dystopia, um, which should be a manga, but probably isn't. Um, it's for full text search, which I feel works very well. I haven't had the opportunity to try it out. And there's Tokyo <coughs> Promenade, which is their content management system built on top of Tokyo Kona. So there, like, there's this whole little suite of tools that you can install and use together, which is kind of interesting. 
Um, this is how you use uh, to account. That's the Justice League International, which is the second lamest Justice League of all time. <laughs> Does anyone know the lamest Justice League of all time? No, no, no. The lamest Justice League of all time is Justice League Detroit. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so we've got, we got Justice League International over there. They're based in New York. Um, and so we created a token cabinet and we want to add the members, right? So we, we got the key, JLI, and then we add all the members. Um, but remember, token cabinet only stores strings. So if we're storing this array, we've got to, we're yamalizing here to serialize it to get it into the token cabinet. And then when we pull it out, we have to unyamal it to get back to options. Um, Okay, so that, that's the latest Justice League of all time. This is like the universe we have playing, fast Justice League of all time. It's the big seven. Uh, Green Lantern, Flash, Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, Aquaman, and Matt Martian, and Hunter. Okay, big seven, sure, big five. Yeah. Um, okay, so, so we've got, this is the example for Tokyo table, uh, the tableau data, right? So we create a new table, and then we can add all these people with their roles, like Superman's Deus Ex Machina, because he can do anything. Uh, Batman's a mastermind, because he can do anything, but he has no preparation time. Green Lantern's space cop, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but, I mentioned it was kind of like a relational database. You can query it. So down here we've got uh, querying the big seven table, and we're going to add a condition the role because all of a sudden we haven't eaten some fish. So Aquaman gets to earn his Justice League stripes. <laughs> I kid. I love Aquaman. <laughs> it's so misunderstood. Um, okay, moving on. Cassandra. Right? So remember, Cassandra is the love child of Diamond and Big Table, uh, and it has interesting aspects of both. So it's calm oriented like Big Table. It has columns, soup columns, and column families. You can think of a column family kind of like a table. You can think of a column kind of like a column in a data, so it's like an attribute value pair, the name value pair, P value pair. And then super columns uh, are collections of columns. So if you had, um, say we had a blob, right, that we modeled, right, then the blob posts would be the column family. Uh, the title would be a column, and the, the text of the post would be a column. And then you could have a super column that is a collection of comment columns. Right? That makes sense. And we'll see an example in a minute. Um, like I said, this is the hardest one for me to get my head around, so I might be explaining it to the satisfaction of everyone in here. Um, one of the glorious things about RubyCon is that there are probably people who know way more about any subject than you do at the conference. So if you just go around asking, what the heck are super columns, someone will answer you. Try that framework. Uh, like Dynamo, it's also distributed. Uh, when you add new nodes of Cassandra, it, it's auto, the data is automatically replicated across them. Uh, it's eventually consistent, which means that when you write one place, it may take a while. It's not guaranteed a, a particular time frame when that data will be available elsewhere, but it will eventually propagate to all the nodes. Uh, and then it's easy to explain. You just add new nodes, and they're automatically rolled into the system. That eventual consistency is the one that gets a lot of people. Um, because they think, no, no, I have to have all my data available from every place every, every time. Um, so Cassandra has two ways of reading data. You can do a weak read, which goes out and checks uh, the first node it finds, essentially, and brings back the answer. Or you can do a forum read, which checks a certain number of nodes, and when they all agree, so they're all consistent, then it brings you back the answer. So if you need just a quick answer, you use a weak read. If you need the, the right answer, you use a forum read. Okay, moving off of traditional comments, we now have, hey, anime. Um, one Piece Pirate, yeah. So we've got, uh, we instantiate, this is Evan Weaver's Cassandra gem, which is pretty sweet, if using Cassandra. Otherwise, we probably don't care. Um, so we instantiate a new Cassandra object, and we're gonna insert people, right? So this is the column family. Uh, these are IDs, and then this name is a column, right? So a column is just a key value pair, and you can have lots of them in here. And then down here, we've got fights, which are, One Piece is a very fight heavy, like, like a lot of them, really. Um, there are a lot of fights. So uh, this is another column family. These are the IDs, they correspond to Luffy, right? That's Luffy, Luffy D monkey. Uh, and then opponents is not a column, it's a super column, because it contains a collection of columns, which are this UUID new two thing, right? Uh, that creates uh, a unique value that includes the person, the people ID in it. So then down here, when we get out the fights, we want all of Luffy's fights. As you can see by my commonly named variable, Luffy fights. Um, then we can cycle over them and get out the names for the people that, that were the opponents at that point. Right, so this is a little bit of relationality in Cassandra. Moving on to document-oriented databases. And a lot of you have probably seen Couch and Mongo, which I'm going to talk about here, but so I'll go pretty quick. Um, 
I think couch explorer because it's really made for the web. Right? It's storage format as JSON, which we're all, A, you can read easily without having to sift through angle brackets to convert. Uh, and B, we're using it a lot of times for our already communication protocols. Uh, it's built such that you access it through HTTP via a RESTful interface. So you're getting documents, you're putting updates to documents, and you're deleting documents. Uh, which means that it's really easy to, to slap it on a server and just hit it from somewhere else, right? Uh, in ways that we're already doing, or we're already making HTTP calls a lot of the time. Views are the thing that trip a lot of people up when they're thinking about adopting CouchDB because they have to be defined at the start. Right? You, can't, you can't query dynamically, you have to create your views initially. <coughs> what it does is it creates an index in CouchDB and then it updates that index as you modify the data. Right? So it's an incremental update as you go. The way you create a view is through JavaScript, just like you insert stuff into it. Um, and you're creating custom MapReduce functions that take a document and cycle over it and say, yes, this is part of the output or not. Now, the other thing that trips some people up for CouchDB is going to have to be is that it doesn't do partial updates. So in, in true RESTful fashion, if you want to update a resource or a document in Couch, you have to send the entire representation, the new representation, and it replaces the existing one. So if you're modeling a, a blog post, as your document, and it has it, like, embedded comment documents within it, and you want to add a new one, you have to send the entire post document with all the existing comments to add that new one. Right? So if you have a highly commented blog with 150 comments per post, then that's going to become a burden over time. This example is not as close to the metal as some of the others. It's on CalPress, but it's just like one level up from the CalPD uh, uh, library of choice. Uh, but it's still pretty basic. Right? So we create a new database, uh, Kanoa, uh, we create a couple of documents in ARIA, which you can learn. And then this part, this third save doc, is actually creating a view. Right? So uh, they go in underscore design, they get a name, this one's TuneIn, because we want to pull out all the, the documents that are TuneIn ninjas. Right? So kind of badass, but not totally badass ninjas. Um, right, uh, this emit is how you say, yeah, this, this document, if it matches this, it's in the result set. Null. Uh, is used for grouping, right? So you can get out an associated array of results if you want to at this point. So if we had ages in here, or you know, uh, like we have shopper type, shopper win right there, if we had that for everybody, we could group by shopper type, so we know all the, the win shopper ninjas and whatever. And then this is how you use it, right? You just call views first tune in, and you get out rows. It brings back JSON, and you can cycle over that just like you would a normal JSON object. MongoDB, uh, again, there was a great talk on this yesterday. It'll be available by conference. You should go watch it. Uh, in light of that, I am just going to talk to you a little bit about some of the differences between it and CacheDB, because they're often seen as sort of major competitors. Uh, storage is actually in binary JSON, which is not JSON. It's, it's another thing. And part of the reason for that, I, I, as I understand it, is because they don't actually work over HTTP, right? They're, they have native clients for access, right? So, uh, they have binary sockets to talk to the database, and then there have been clients written for it, like uh, every language you'd want to use. Probably white space even, I don't even know. Um, but you can't learn how to read them anymore. Uh, so, so access is actually a lot faster in the couch because you're not going over HTTP, and you're going over a binary socket. Um, there's another benefit over couch. The queries are dynamic. You can create indexes, and then you can query on them. Uh, there's even a shell for Mongo that you can just go in and type your queries, and it's just like a nice spell shell. It's not SQL. The other benefit, it, allow, it does allow partial updates. So there was an example yesterday of a pop, uh, pushing a comment onto a stack of blog post comments in a document, and you can do just that with the ID of the document and the new comment with the appropriate operator. Um, so so that, that's a better solution for some domains than Calc would be. Okay, so I, I felt like there hasn't been enough Marvel love, so now we're gonna talk about the Avengers. Um, so to use Mongo, this is using, uh, <coughs> it's the standard Mongo, it's not using Mongo Mapper. Right? Mongo Mapper is a, is an ORM layer on top of the Mongo library. This is the Mongo library. So we create a new DB for Avengers and a collection of it for members. And then we add a bunch of members. Right? These are the, the initial members uh, in the first issue, which you see over there. No, okay, so I have to say, right, over here, you say Thor, Ant-Man, Hulk, Iron Man, but there's a fifth Avenger. Why does the Wasp get left out of the big banner up top? The Wasp is just as useful as Ant-Man. Right? <laughs> and you say, look, there she is. He's writing ants. She can fly, that's cool. Anyway, right, so I'm offended on behalf of Walt. Okay, so then here we can create an edit from name. Right? We can pull out one of them just by trying, right? Um, we pull out Ant-Man at the end. In between issue one and issue two, Ant-Man turned into Giant-Man, because I figured that if you're too shrinky, people, maybe one should be a growing person. 
so, so we update the name of the Mizzou. Uh, I think in one of the early issues, the Hulk left because he was very violent and there were some psychological tensions among the team. Um, so he went away and then later they found Captain America. So here we remove the Hulk and here we insert Captain America as, as the new new Avenger. And finally, Neo 4 J, the last of the examples is the graph database one, which is the last of the work. Um, I've talked a little bit about graph database before, right? So this is going to be pretty stripped down. Uh, structure is based on nodes and edges, and both are sets of key value pairs. They're like documents from a document database that just have potentially more powerful connections between them. Queries, it actually uses Lucene for the querying, which means that you can query in a lot of really interesting ways that we're already familiar with because a lot of them are using Lucene or Solar or something like that. Now, so the example for Neo4j is going to get a little more complicated because there's a lot more stuff going on. It's actually split over three slides. Um, the first one, I'm creating this person class with the Neo4j node mix in. So this person, whoever it is, is going to be a node <coughs> of Neo4j as a person edge. It's got a couple properties that are indexed. Um, name is obvious. Mute is just going to say it can be a boolean for true or mute, false or not. Um, and then we've got some relationships here. We've got interests for that unrequited love stuff, uh, dates for you know one-time hookups or whatever, and then marriages for stable, serious relationships. And what we're going to be modeling is, is over here. Right? It's, it's uh, Magneto's love quadrangle of the sort. Um, so Esme was a, a young telepath who had a crush on him. He had a crush on Wasp at one point. He made out with Rogue, I guess, at one point. And then he married Magda and had this scrum and puts over who you're all familiar with, I'm sure. <laughs> um, okay, so now that we've got our classes, we can, it, it, basically I just did that class so that I could convince the, the code a little more and don't repeat myself. Um, so we're just gonna create a bunch of people, right? So Magnus person, these are all creating nodes. Esme's person, Rogue's, those three are all mutants. And then Magda and the Wasp actually aren't mutants. Uh, the Wasp counter powers from her husband, Hank Pam, before he beat her up, um, which is terrible. <laughs> okay, so um, now we can add the relationships. Um, Magneto had a crush on the Wasp. He married Magda. He had a date with Rogue. Esme had a crush on Magneto. Magda married, and, and because Neo 4J doesn't do bidirectional relationships by default, uh, you, you can set it up to do that. So when you declare relationships, you can say, uh, when you create this, essentially, this is not code, but when you create this relationship, create this reflexive relationship as well. Um, but I didn't do that, so we have to define the, the reciprocal ones by hand down there. And then to query it, um, we can get in and out, right? I want Magneto, and then I want to see who likes Magneto. And it comes back with Esme, because she's the only one who has a crush on him. Uh, and the no so this part just gives you the relationships, and adding nodes on the end gives you the actual endpoints for those relationships. And then, so Magneto is all about the purity of being kind, and Secure, you know, <coughs> sapiens. So let's find out if he really walks the talk as he, he does it. Who has he dated? Who's not a mutant? Uh, and, so, and so that's this query, right? And we just give an array of the nodes that he's dated that aren't mutants. Uh, in fact, I don't think he dated anybody who wasn't a mutant, but he did marry a non mutant. So I don't know if I need a. That's what's funny to do. Um, okay, so uh, actually, I'm pretty close on time, so I'm going to zip through this. You can simulate things, just like uh, altering complete languages you can, you can do in Python, the same things you can do in Ruby, it's just harder in one than the other. Right? Um, you can model things in non-relational languages and relational that, So you're simulating the structure at that point, right? So maybe you've got Superman's pal wearing a helmet of hate, um, and you've got a document that's a person document, and it has a company ID that maps out to this underscore ID built in by Mongo. Um, so you're essentially rolling your own form piece support at that point. Maybe you should go with something that actually has 20 keys if you want to do this. Uh, you can also model lack of structure. And frankly, famously did this recently. Right? They've got a big blob where they store all their, their serialized data. And th I, I say this is also kind of a bad idea. This is one example, right? Where I just uh, took a hash, put it in YAML, and stored it in a, in a content text field. Um, at this point, you're losing a lot of the benefits of the relational data, right? Because you can't do a referential integrity into that, that serialized data structure. It's a big pain. Uh, this is the entity attribute value pattern, where we have maybe the person table was originally full of sparse data, um, and then we so we extracted that out and we have attributes, and it's essentially like a little, you know, it's a it's a it's a virtual schema that we build up in here, but we don't gain the benefits of it being in the relational database at this point because you can't link out to the value of the attribute. Right? And finally, uh, we come back to relational databases, and I think that. This is probably my favorite expansion of the NoSQL term because it, it 
hopefully it, it alleviates the fears of the Lakel David Furnace that we're trying to get rid of. Um, but it, it also says that you know there's still something we need to look at because SQL doesn't always work. And, and I think caching is a great example of this sort of hybrid approach because we're already doing it. Who here is using memcache? Right. You got a hybrid system if you have a database. I mean, maybe you just have memcache and that's great, but most of you probably have a database if you've got a hybrid system. You could easily swap RIS into that memcache installation and maybe run it on memory, but it would work the same sort of way. Logging is a new example. Uh, this GitHub plugin uh, replaces the Rails default logging facility with the MongoDB instance, and it logs in there, which lets you do cool things with querying the logs. And then most interesting for these sort of hybrid approaches are, are hybrid domains. Uh, sometimes you're actually pooling together two different domains. Um, so if you know Lulu.com, right, it's a, it's a publishing, I'm not saying they actually do what I'm about to say, but they could. It's a self-publishing or, or a Jeff Rosenbach's peak code, right, where they're selling PDFs and you've got user accounts. Okay, so e-commerce is a, is a traditionally relational domain. It fits a relational schema very well. But if you're selling documents, maybe it makes sense to put them in a document-oriented database. Call me crazy, but naming stuff is powerful. Uh, similarly, dating sites, right? You could take money from people uh, in the e-commerce relational magical database, and then you have a social graph in the graph database that says, oh, Johnny dated Sally, and Sally dated you know, Billy, and Billy hates Johnny because he dated Sally. You, know, right? you could manage all those relationships much more easily in the graph database. That's it. Oh, sorry. I thought I saw a, a black site green layer screen on there. For the comments. Anyway, okay, so different scales of data. Uh, if you think about a photo sharing site where you've got maybe hundreds of thousands of users and they're uploading hundreds of millions of photos, right, you have to ask about scaling requirements between those sets of data. So maybe it makes sense to partition them out so that the user accounts are in a relational database and the photo stuff is in a more scalable. This is like the only time I, I bow to the, the, the scalability argument when you want to scale. Sometimes it, it might work in your current situation. Okay, last section. Next steps. What do I want you to do? I want you to go and explore. And there are a number of resources out there. There's uh, this internetmindmap.com wiki that has just this gigantic list of databases grouped by family that's very useful. Uh, the NoSQL Google group is kind of active. It's not like, ridiculously active. Uh, occasionally they'll have explosions like the GTM thing that, that's recently happened. Um, but it's, it's a great place just to sort of keep your finger on the pulse. The NoSQL ecosystem paper is from Rackspace. It's a great overview of a lot of the, these same issues. And then I actually set up a Google Wave for this talk that if you want to be in and continue the discussion after this talk, you know, find me or email me and, and we'll get you on the Google Wave and, and we'll see what happens. I, I have yet to find a good useful way, so I'm hoping this is it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Next step, ignore the database. When you start an application, uh, start with logical <coughs> modeling and don't be constrained by the physical database you're included in. Right? Think about the, the data first and then see what comes of it. Maybe you'll find that you don't actually need a relational database, maybe you need a graph database. Um, just sort of be mindful of, of the domain you're working in. And then finally, and this is something I post about on my blog, uh, changing the default is a ridiculously powerful technique. Right? Uh, there was a study in Sweden, I guess, about organ donation. Originally it was opt-in, where you get the card person to say, yes, I want to organ donate. And then they changed it to opt-out, and the participation rates went up by like 80% or something ridiculous. Like, it was amazing. Um, because people stick with what they're given. So if you, you can work, make this work to your advantage by changing your own default. The next time you fire up a, a little throwaway application, try changing your default and using Mongo or Redis or Calc or something and just see how it works. Okay? Uh, in Rails, you can do this application templates. <coughs> I have one on GitHub as a gist that takes out all the active directory stuff and inserts Mongo. Um, and and it, it's, it's how I got interested in this in the first place. And uh, that's it. Hey, here's all my information. Uh, that's speedrunning.com. I would appreciate it if you guys would go there and rate me and give me comments so that I can become a better speaker and we can all have better conferences because then there are more conferences to be better. Uh, and then Vigit.com Extend is our company blog where I and Tony and other people blog and then Vinscope.com is mine. And I don't think I have any quite time for questions. No, it's 10 15. <coughs> okay. So if, if you have questions, you know, attack me in the halls. Preferably not about <laughs> Thank you.